Well, thank you all for having me here. And thanks, Aurora, for organizing all of this. It's really nice. Uh, I'm going to tell you some, th some work that I've been doing in collaboration with Enrico Sandro Colizzi, who will be presenting next as well, and uh, Roland Merckx. Uh, we're both connected to the Origin Center in the Netherlands, where we specifically are studying the origin of multicellularity. So if the evolution of multicellularity is considered one of the major evolutionary transitions. And I think one of the major reasons why we find it so fascinating is that we intuitively perceive a sort of conflict at the center uh, of this transition. On the one hand, we kind of recognize that having this new level of organization uh, allows for all kinds of new uh, functions, uh, evolutionary innovation. So for instance, the elephant can level a tree, which uh, Paramecia definitely cannot do. On the other hand, we sort of intuitively perceive that uh, there must be some kind of cost involved in becoming multicellular cells will suddenly have to share all their resources with their neighbors. And there may be a reproductive division of labor involved, which means that you don't get to reproduce into the next generation. And overall, there may be a sense of a loss of individuality, like uh, Sylvia very nicely described. So uh, to the point that indeed the cells of the elephant, each individual cell is much simpler than uh, or these uh, unicellular proteins like uh, paramecium. So this conflict sounds very plausible, but the trick then becomes to find out which costs and which benefits cells actually perceive at the transition to multicellularity, which kinds of interactions actually drive the evolution of multicellularity. So in this work, Sandro and I tried to step away a bit and see what kind of selection pressures can emerge just from the interactions between cells, which would allow for novel functions, and their interaction with the environment, which determines uh, what cells actually have to do to survive. So uh, let me show this uh, in action. So here we have a single, little uh, in silico cell. The implementation is not very important right now, but this little cell can migrate and it can do chemotaxis. That is, it can sense a chemotactic signal locally. And this is what you see in this beautiful yellow to red gradient here. And so in principle, this cell has all the uh, toolkits needed to find the peak of the, uh, of the gradient where some resources might be had. But what we can see here is that it's actually not doing very well. So why is that? Well, this cell perceives the signal, but it perceives this only locally. And it's a small cell and the gradient is very shallow and noisy. So for the cell at each individual time point, it's really unclear where the peak actually is. So this whole gradient that we from a distance can see so clearly might as well not really exist for this cell. But what happens now if we have a bunch of these cells that are sticking together? Each of them exactly the same as the single cell you saw before. But as a whole, they are able to perform chemotaxis and migrate uh, up to the gradient. So what changed for these cells? Because mechanistically, they're still working exactly the same way. Well, actually, at the cell level, they don't see a lot of changes. On the top here, you can see the cell track of one single cell doing migration. And you see that the track is very noisy, very swirly. But on the right, you see the track of, of cells in the blob. And it's still very noisy and swirly they don't migrate any faster uh, in, the, in the cluster. They are still very bad at perceiving the actual direction of the gradient. And so the only thing that changes is that when you compare the straight segments of their tracks, the tracks that are aimed at the uh, gradient peak uh, 
are a little longer. So all that happens in the cluster is that through pushing and pulling on each other, cells keep each other moving in the right direction just ever so slightly longer. And this is enough to then lead to this effective uh, chemotaxis. So then we thought, well, could this sort of emergent function be enough to then uh, drive the evolution of multicellularity? So we have this evolutionary simulation with a population of cells that initially don't really stick. And each season, the position of the peak of the gradient changes. And then at the end of the season, cells that are closer to the peak get to reproduce more. Then some, there is some random cell death and the new season uh, starts and they will have to find the peak all over again. And when they reproduce, they can change a little bit how much they stick to other cells, either more or less. And you see very nicely happening here that this is enough to make them evolve clustering and then neatly migrate to the uh, peak of the gradient every season. Does this happen always? Well, no. So when the seasons are very short, they don't evolve this uh, adhesion. And instead, they opt for a strategy where they spread out as much as possible and hope that the next season, the peak happens to be in their place so they get to reproduce. So they have a sort of uh, betting strategy going on. For intermittent uh, season duration, you get evolutionary bistability. So that means that depending on the initial population, how sticky that is, they either evolve to become uh, a cluster or not. So why is that the case? Well, it turns out that one strategy uh, interferes with the invasion of the other, and that is true in both directions. So when you have a large initial population of non-sticky cells, it's very hard for a small cluster of uh, adhering cells to get to the peak because they get blocked by the other cells. And the reverse is also true. So what this, how we interpret this is that there is this sort of non-genetic uh, uh, protection against reversal of multicellularity, but also a protection against invasion of multicellularity, depending on your initial uh, population. So what I've been telling you so far has recently been published in eLife uh, with the reference at the bottom. Uh, and now I am working on a follow-up of this project because so far, we've given uh, cells basically one degree of freedom, which is how much do you want to adhere? And that is all they can change in order to solve the evolutionary problem that we uh, put for in before, before them. So now I am uh, giving cells a small uh, evolvable regulatory network uh, with which they can integrate both their internal states, so how many times they divide it, and the gradient information to decide whether they want to migrate right now or whether they want to divide. And they have a maximum of three divisions per season. And so what we see happening uh, so far is that when they cannot evolve adhesion, so we don't allow them to evolve uh, uh, stickiness, they evolve a strategy which, uh, where they first race towards the peak before dividing. If instead they are allowed to evolve adhesion, they always do, even though they have enough time to do all of it, migration and division, and the gradient this time is very steep and non-noisy. So they don't really need to stick to each other, but still they do. And once they do, they shift their division moment to become earlier and earlier. And so we, what this seems to point to is that in this situation, the cells are each other's selective environment. So the main thing they're trying to solve is dealing with each other in this uh, interesting mix of cooperation and competition. And so I will leave you with a, this uh, sliding frame of an adhering cluster uh, of cells where you can nicely see the waves of uh, divisions going through the tissue. And I'll pose to you the question, 
can we push this model to start evolving multicellular embryonic development? And thank you for your attention.